O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor and miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading for this third Sunday in Advent is from prophet Isaiah, the 35th chapter. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. It shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The second reading is from James' epistle, the fifth chapter, beginning with the seventh verse. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also, be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate 
and merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
during this season of penitence and rejoice. Now we might ask, don't we and shouldn't we rejoice every Sunday? And of course, the answer is yes. But remember, St. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, which we sang as the antiphon to the intro, was exhorting the Philippians and all Christians to rejoice in all things, even suffering. And so we should. But it's not all that easy. Even during this season of Advent, anticipating the coming of Christmas and all the joy that goes with that, we still need something to rejoice about as we wait. After all, look around. Our nation is still sending troops to fight in distant lands. People are still shooting up schools and places of business. The economy is still tottering as the government keeps spending. Bad weather still threatens. People still go to the doctor and hear bad news. People, even our loved ones, are still dying. Sin still has its effect in this world as families are torn apart, as corruption and violence surrounds us. So it might not be so easy to rejoice. Just because Pastor or the prophet Isaiah or the Apostle Paul or even Jesus himself says so. Even St. John, the baptizer, had his moment of doubt as he sat in prison waiting for some good news about the Messiah. John, the greatest among those born of women, the chosen prophet to proclaim the coming of the Lord, the last herald, the last prophet to announce God's anointed arrival, he doesn't seem to be rejoicing in today's gospel reading. No, he's stuck behind the bars. His future uncertain. So he sends his followers to Jesus. For their sake and his own, John wants to know if Jesus is really the one. After all, look at what John has sacrificed. He has forsaken his normal life to live in the wilderness, to lay it on the line for Jesus. And look what he gets as a reward. Jail time. He doesn't know whether he's going to live out the day or not. So he sends his followers to ask Jesus the question. But whether John is suffering a moment of doubt or if this is just for the sake of his, his disciples or not, we should remember that as we live out our days, each one of us will be tempted to have our moments of doubt as well especially when things are not going our ways, or the way we think it should be going, or the way we have planned. So like John, when we have those moments of wondering if Jesus really is the one, when we wonder if all the things we've heard and seen and read and believed are really true, we must do as he did. We must go to Jesus. We seek him out and we get our answer. And of course, the answer is found in one place only, the Word of God. John sent his messengers to the Word made flesh for his assurance. And now the Word made flesh sends his messengers to you so that you can be reassured that everything that has been said about Christ your Lord is true. And so Jesus is asked the question, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answers, go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Did you catch that? Even as Jesus is reassuring John that his faith is not misplaced, he is also reminding John not to give up so easily and not to lose hope in the midst of suffering. Jesus teaches that the cost of following him is division with the world. 
that the world and the devil will hate you for following Jesus. In fact, we too can expect suffering for our faith. Even divided families, as Jesus himself said, because of him. Just as our Lord suffered in his coming to redeem the world, we too must remember that he was misused and mistreated by the very people he came to redeem. And if our Lord and his prophets were mistreated, rejected, and condemned, what can we expect as we stand up for the gospel in this world that hates its Lord? And so when this happens to you, don't be offended on account of Christ. Remember all that he has done for you. In a moment of weakness, we too might ask, then why even bother being a Christian if things aren't going to go easy for us, if we're still going to suffer and die like everyone else? What's there to rejoice in when you're rotting away in a prison? You've been rejected because of your faith. What good does it do to be a disciple or a Christian if you're still going to die? <coughs> the good is that in the midst of your suffering, and even in your dying, even in the midst of temptation by the devil in your own flesh, Christ is with you. He is the one. He is the Messiah. And he has shown that through his miracles, proving beyond all doubt that he is the one who has come. He's the one that all the prophets have foretold, and even of whom John himself points a hopeless world to for hope. Because Jesus is worthy. He does show that he has lived up to the things that have been promised about him, just as prophesied in the scriptures. And that means that through his life, death, and resurrection, the miracles he has promised you of rebirth to his fruit and water as water and the word, nothing less than the forgiveness of your sins, proclaimed in his name, and even your own resurrection from the dead, are true. And he did them for you in his coming, in his taking on flesh. It was all for your sin. And that's how we can rejoice. By believing Jesus in his word and promises, no matter what happens to us in this life, no matter how things might look, how dark the skies might be, no matter what. And by the way, if we think Jesus was great for all that he did, I'm sorry, John was great for all that he did, living in the wilderness, prophesying the coming of Messiah, living on honey and locusts, well, guess what? For as great as he was among the prophets, even the least in Jesus' kingdom is greater than he. And that's good news for us poor sinners. We who have not sacrificed all for the Lord. You see, your place in the kingdom is not based on how great you are. If it were, you'd always be worried about whether you still even have a place because of the way we live the way we treat others, the way we fail to love God the way we should. And that is when, and that is what often tempts us as we sit languishing like John in lonely exile for our faith, or on a hospital bed, or even in a church pew. You see, if that's <coughs> what it means to be a Christian, then if that's what it means to even be the forerunner, then we might be asking, what does Christ's kingdom really look like for us? You see, even the faithful will suffer, but thanks be to God. It's not in the amount of your suffering or in anything that you do that you merit God's mercy. Our sinful human nature doesn't necessarily like to hear that. We always like to take some credit. But again, the good news is this, that when you suffer, our Lord will be with you in all things. That even when it looks like the bad guys are winning and Satan seems to have the upper hand and sin and the troubles of this world seem ready to devour us. Remember, when it all seems hopeless, that's when we have the greatest hope in Christ and his promises because we must always remember that he is the one who has gone before us even into death and hell itself for our sakes that we might receive his promises of everlasting you see, even before John, the prophet Isaiah foretold good news for rejoicing with the coming of Jesus. He told the, the people that the Messiah will strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. The 
prophet said, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. You see, with those words, believing in Christ, clinging to him, we can be strong. You see, your Lord has given you strength to the preaching of the gospel. But if even John can be tempted to death, how can we be strong when we're facing what the world and the devil throws at us? When temptation to sin and temptation to doubt stares us in the face? Again, by going back to Christ. By remembering that Jesus does not abandon his people in their time of suffering. He didn't abandon John. He doesn't abandon you. We must remember that and trust that God has sent his deliverer to, send, to save us from our sins, death, and the devil himself. By remembering that you have been baptized. By going back to those baptismal waters, that's where God has saved you and connected you to your Savior. Remember, just like the blind man who has given sight, your eyes have been opened to see Jesus for who he is, your Redeemer and Lord. You also remember that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and took on our human nature to do what the prophet said he would do, to bring you the recompense of God to come and save you. His name even means that. God will save his people. As the prophet Isaiah declared concerning the Messiah Jesus, when his kingdom comes, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. See, Jesus used his miracles to prove to the people that he was exactly who he claimed to be. The very Messiah who had set captives free. He'd even given this promise to John, and that reassures as John sat in prison suffering for his faith. After all, remember, true prophets get harassed and suffer for their message. Even Jesus himself came for that very, very reason. The greatest and most perfect prophet ever. The true prophet would suffer on the cross dying for your sins, and even there proclaiming the good news of his salvation to those who hear and believe. So, was Jesus the one? Of course. How do you know? Because Jesus is the one of whom the Bible teaches. We wouldn't even read the Bible if it wasn't for the fact that it shows us Christ our Savior. You see, the Bible shows us that it promises through God's word that he is the one who was promised to be born of the virgin. He's the one who healed the paralytic. He's the one who raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He's the one who healed and cleansed the lepers. He's the one who gave sight to blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is even the one who brought Lazarus back from the grave, foretelling and foreshowing his own resurrection and yours as well, because Jesus is the one who conquered death for you. He's the only one who's died for the sins of the world. But you might have the forgiveness of your sins through faith in him. He's the one who's promised that even death leads you to life, an eternal life that only he can give. Because he's the one who opens up the ears of the spiritually deaf to hear and believe. And he's opened up your ears to the preaching of the gospel. And God has even given you another promise in the waters of holy baptism. Even as we be water in this wilderness of sin in which we live. Remember what we confess from the small catechism. From the second petition of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. What does this mean? The kingdom of God certainly comes by itself in power of prayer. But we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. How does God's kingdom come? Are we to seek it out in places apart from the word? Of course not. God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit, so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word, and then lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. So on this third Sunday in Advent, we have much to rejoice about. Christ's kingdom has come. You have been baptized into His holy name. Everything He promises has been given to you. What He has done is offered to you now. Even though what he promises to do is not fully been revealed, that won't happen until the last day. Even now, you have already received eternal life as you are part of his kingdom this day. By having heard the word, you can trust it when the prophet said, 
The ransom of the Lord shall return to come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and the <coughs> shall flee away. Therefore do rejoice, dear Christians. Remember, your place in this kingdom is assured. Your Lord has come from heaven above to give you that promise through his life, suffering, and death, that even though you may not deny yourself the way John did, living in the wilderness, wearing scratchy clothing, <coughs> under the lotus, even if you can't live up to the expectations of God's law perfectly, he has been given the very kingdom itself. In fact, he's been given the greatest of gifts from God. If the greatest of miracles performed here week after week to strengthen and sustain you in your faith, to give you courage as you face temptation and even death itself, because the very keys of the kingdom of God have been given to you, the church, the believers, the baptized. Christ has given you, his bride, the very keys to unlock the doors of the prison of sin and set us prisoners free. See, the greatest of miracles even greater than seeing the lame jump and walk, even greater than seeing the blind <coughs> in their sight, is this, that every week we see God forgiving the sins of his people. We witness God opening the eyes of the blind through his Holy Spirit every time the gospel is preached. And we see the dead raised up to eternal life when God works faith in his people every time we see a baptism. You see, those are the greatest of miracles that he would do for us the least of his people, to bring us into his kingdom, and to give us reason to rejoice this Sunday and always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. <laughs> amen. You have been watching the Divine Service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our divine service is followed by adult Bible study and Sunday school at 1030.